Welcome to Revere Asset Management's Your Money with Danny Stewart. The market will always overshoot to the downside and to the upside. And Don Vandenborg. Because it's not how much you make in the markets, it's how much of that you can keep. Is Bitcoin having ha- having a baby today? Ha- halving? That's a hard word to pronounce. Bitcoin is halving today. Now, from Bitcoin to fear, the BDs, the broker-dealers, are now selling fear. That's the new theme to Jur. And remember, Bitcoin ETFs were all the rage a few months ago. Guess what? Now it's these buffered ETFs. They're coming. Fidelity's coming out with three new buffered ETFs to protect your downside but with caps, so it caps your upside too. Sounds like indexed annuities. Uh, Sequence of returns, anyone? Don, I just saw an annuity company send out a sequence of returns. I'm going to, someone sent it to me in the mailbag. I'm going to go over that because it's perfect. Here's the question I have, folks, and this is going to be the overall theme for today's show. Why not just have a sell discipline? If you've got a sell discipline and a smoother equity curve, All of these things will work themselves out. And are you mega rich? Do you know what the definition is of mega rich? It might surprise you, but the government is talking about forcing mega RMDs, required minimum distributions, on massive retirement accounts. Okay? Now, the problem I have with that is people... Retirement accounts are your own money that you withheld, that you took risks. The only way to, that's not inherited money. That's not, that's money you already paid tax on and you stuck it in these, these 401ks or IRAs and you took a lot of risk to get them because they put limits on how much you can put in to these IRAs or 401ks. There's limits every year that everybody gets to do. Even if you're making a hundred million dollars a year, you're capped at 30,000 in your 401k, just like I am. I'm not making a hundred million dollars a year, but if I got that big, big mega RMD, that means I probably got concentrated in just one or two stocks and took a whole lot of risk and hit a home run. But here's a novel concept. Why not have a discussion on how those big mega, big mega retirement accounts got to be mega and see if we can replicate that for more people so we don't punish hard work, but rather emulate it. Just saying. Um, now, um, speaking of Bitcoin, their troubles are getting worse. That's also in the mailbag. They may have some legal wranglings, and it's really more the custo- the like Coinbase. They they have they're they're a custodian. They're they're holding these uh, Bitcoins, and it's really they're still really trying to decide how they're going to what they're going to call Bitcoin. How it, how its definition as a security. I'm not going to dive too deep in that, but you can certainly uh, look in the mailbag. And then RMDs, not if, but when tax. And so I talked about that last week. Someone sent in an example, but there's also an article on RMDs about when to take them. Folks, the new RMD rules, you got to take them out anytime in, in within 10 years when you inherit them. And so you got to look at your tax rates and see when it's best to do that equally over 10 years, all in the 10th year, if you're retired or bleed it off a little bit. So it's not so big when you do retire, that's all comes down to planning. But anyway, let's go to the mailbag first. And this is going to set up kind of our theme for the show today. Now, again, I'm going to go in kind of reverse order. The legal system's closing in on crypto. Uh, Crypto uh, suffered their worst string of court uh, cases in March, and this April may not be any better. They have some cases. You can go read that article. I'm not going to go down that. Then I got another article from KC. Good morning. Just saw this article. Might be of interest. Have a good day. Pension funds are pulling billions from stocks. Me, bottom line, pensions are underfunded and have only now gotten close to being almost fully funded, except for government pensions. They're still a 25% shortfall. So they, they're, they're, they, they're only 75% fully funded. But what happens when we get to the next bear market, which might be closer than we think? They're going to just go down again because they buy and hold with whatever asset allocation. They pick an asset allocation at the beginning of the year. 
and they may go up a little bit in stocks or down a little bit, more to bonds, some to private equity. But then they set it and forget it for the whole year and then reevaluate at the beginning of next year. So basically one big change a year. And what these uh, pension funds have done, which may be reflective of some of the softness in the money market at the end of Q1, they took lots of money out of stocks and put it more toward bonds and even private equity. That's another article in the um, show notes uh, that you can read. Now, this is uh, 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 an email that investors said, and it's sequence of returns. And this is actually one of the insurance companies. I actually own a life insurance from them uh, who because uh, I need life insurance. It's to insure a risk. It's not an investment. Hit number one. Anyway, it's they're they're hawking indexed annuities, right? And so they have this example, January 1st of 69 through December of 1993. So they do this like long 30 year period. It says this hypothetical illustration is for uh, illustrated purposes only, not reflective of performance of any product. So they did this uh, long term study and they did the returns every year. You start out with a hot $500,000 investment, you average 7.4 average return. 4% withdraws, increasing 3% in, for inflation, and negative returns during the early years. That's because 69, 70, 70, those were tough years. And he said, and then positive returns in later years were not enough to sustain the income. In other words, they started off and they had big drawdown before the market started going back up where you're compounding from a much lower base. That's what Don's talked about a lot. In the second example, they just flip-flop the order of the returns. So the first return is actually from 1993, and the last return is from 69. They just totally reversed the order. So you had nice big gains at first, compounding big, and then you had negative returns. Okay, They still had substantial cash value even with the negative returns in later years, and they had a legacy to leave to their kids. And if you want to see this, I'll send you the article. I'll send you the, the, the sheet. You can just email me, and I'll be happy to send it to you. But it's very, very different. Sequence of returns basically says that three years in and at retirement really determines the quality of retirement that you have. Why is that? If you do, you've heard that story, you put in a thousand bucks a month from the time you're 25 to 60, you, you annualize 8% a year, 8% uh, annualize a year, and then at a thousand dollars a month, every month for you know 25 to 60. And when you retire, you get a gold watch and the pot of gold, the million dollars at the end of the, at the end of the time. And this study was trying to figure out how come that doesn't always happen. Well, sequence of return says the three years in and at retirement really dictates. Well, if you make 8% on $10,000, that's 800 bucks, big deal. 800, 8% on 100,000 is 8,000. 800 on a mil, 8% on a million is 80,000. Point being is all the compounding, 80, 70, 80, 90% of all the gains occur in the last four, three, four, five years right before you retire. So if you go into retirement and there's a bear market right before you do it, you got half as much money. If you retire in 1999, you got twice as much than if you retire in 2001 or two. Now, their other assumption is that you buy an income for life, another dumb idea, rabbit hole I don't want to go into, but it assumes that you just take all your risk off the table and, and get out. Point being is the older you get, the more important a cell discipline becomes because time is not on your side and compounding works both ways. So if you're young, 25, 30, I personally believe a cell discipline is still very important because it smooths out your equity curve, but you still have time to bail you out for big mistakes. The closer you get in before retirement, the, le the, the, the less mistakes you can make. So now, what I am going to do is I'm going to read one more uh, 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 mailbag, and then I'm going to throw it over to Don, because with the markets in turmoil right now, I mean, the biggest question I have for you, the listener, is are you giving up all the gains just in this last week, week and a half that you've made this year? Have you made any changes? 
or are you just going to simply give up all those gains? Now, who knows? The market could turn around and race up tomorrow. But right now, uh, we'll talk to Don and the guys, but the S&P, I think, is even below 5 It's right 4% right now. Small caps are probably negative or flat, and the NASDAQ is, is not very positive this year anymore either. A couple of weeks ago, that was not the case. Before I lead, read this last mailbag, one last article that's in there that's interesting because people always think that higher interest rates are terrible for stocks. It says high interest rates haven't always been the problem. And this guy goes down, d- goes back and does a long, longer term study. And he says the average rate of return uh, was 7.7 in months. The 10-year tr- uh, treasury was below four. And it's 14.5 in months that it was 6% or higher. Okay, that's an average, 14.5 is annualized, obviously. And so basically he's saying that actually with a little bit higher rates, the market returns are higher. That's counterintuitive. It actually kind of makes a little bit of sense because really low rates can be reflective of a sluggish economy that the Fed's trying to juice it and trying to help the economy recover. Now, when they took rates down to zero a few years back, then it, that takes the f- risk-free rate completely out of the equation and it makes bonds almost worthless. That's why the 2022, they had the bonds had the worst year ever in the bond market. By the way, that's why you need a sell discipline for bonds as well. Longer term, maybe not as active as stocks, but you need it. Point being is just because rates are higher than they were a couple years ago does not mean the stock market cannot go up. Don't think that. It can add a little headwinds, but it doesn't mean it can't go up. All right. Last mailbag, and then we're going to Don Ho. This is from 417. This is from JB, and he is a client. We were kind of going over some stuff, and he, he so I can't read the whole mailbag, some of it's personal, but he said, and here's what his, and he, this guy's an active trader. He's an IBD guy. He loves this kind of stuff. And he said, my main question is, what is your profit and loss plan? For example, O'Neill's plan was to take 20% of profits, except for the most powerful stocks, triggered by the eight-week rule, and cut losses at a maximum of 8% below the purchase price, meaning 8% stop loss. This plan gave him at least a 2.5 to 1 risk to reward ratio. Don said, hi, JB, great question. I will go in more detail tomorrow. Uh, But the short answer is position sizing is one area where we differ from O'Neill. He used a consistent 50%, 30%, 20%, and Don will explain that, regardless of the volatility, why we used a volatility-based position size and pyramid rules. So with that, I am going to let Don extrapolate. And uh, Don, so with that... Uh, why don't you kind of go over the markets and kind of this big change? Because in the last couple of weeks, the market's definitely changed its character. Uh, yeah, you're right about that, Dan. And the, the markets uh, switched from a healthy posture to a risky posture, especially with the break of the 50-day moving average. Anybody that's been uh, listening to the podcast or the nightly emails has been tuned in uh, to what we've been saying. But to address the mailbag, um, I have a little uh, spreadsheet example here, and O'Neill, uh, his the basic strategy is uh, on a hundred thousand dollar account, you would own eight positions at twelve and a half percent each. Uh, you would pyramid your first buy would be fifty percent, the second one would be thirty percent, the third one would be twenty percent if your first buy uh, took hold. So in this example here, the first buy with a six point two five percent size. If you hit your 20% profit target on that, you would make $1,250. The overall impact to the portfolio would be 1.25%. Uh, if you hit your stop at 8%, you would lose $500. The impact to the portfolio would be minus 0.5%. So in other words, if you're familiar with the concept of R, which is risk, O'Neill's R was a half of a percent on the portfolio. So if your initial half size buy hit its 8% stop, you would lose 0.5%. So any gains that he makes, you want it to be a multiple of R, ideally at least two times what your R is. In this in this case, uh, the way he would uh, do his sells is it's a two and a half to one with a 20% gain versus an 8% loss. So in Grotection, 
we size according to volatility. Some of these, uh, like for example, the worst loss, uh, these are a bunch of trades over 20, uh, 23 to 20 uh, through this year. Uh, we got caught in a move down in AI and the it was a 27% loss, but it was only on a 0.5% position size. So even that size loss, uh, the impact to the overall portfolio was only minus 0.14. We target between uh, 0.12 and 0.25, depending on whether it's a stock or an ETF and the volatility. Uh, that's the most we want to lose on an individual sized uh, trade. So O'Neill's uh, was minus 0.5, and that's taken a 6.25% position. We target uh, 0.15 to 0 0.2 uh, with smaller size position, depending on the volatility of the overall. Uh, instrument. In this case, AI was a pretty volatile stock when we were trading it, and that's why we're uh, size smaller on it. So that's the explanation uh, on that. But back to the markets. Uh, yeah, once things broke the 50-day moving average, and I think we talked about this last week during the podcast, we were right on the brink of a support area. Uh, and by the end of the day on Friday, we had broken that support area. That was uh, on the uh let's see that was on the yeah the 12th last uh last friday a uh monday we broke the 50 day friday uh we made a decisive lower low at still holding the 50 day uh, but we've just gotten more defensive we've got uh, a maximum exposure that we have when we're under the 50 day moving average we're obeying that level uh we let the market basically take us out with um either loss cutting or uh, our gains that we had pulling back to levels that uh, dictate that the position be closed. And we've been detailing that on uh, the videos every night. But uh, here we are in the S&P 500 battling right around the 5,000 area. Overnight Thursday, we had a big flush on uh, Israel attacking Iran in retaliation for the attack that they did the prior weekend. And the market, the S&P 500 flushed as low as uh, 40, uh, 4029, I believe it was. Yeah, the 100 day moving average is 4935 on here. Or so 4929, and then it bounced at that level. We've been talking about uh, letting the market bounce around between the 100 day moving average and the 50 day moving average, as it often does, which is the equivalent of the 10 week and the 20 week. And you can see uh, several times back here during the uptrend that we had in uh, 2021, you can see that. That on pullbacks, the area between uh, the 10 week and the 20 week is where the market stops going down and resumes the uptrend. So we're kind of watching that. If we do break below that 20 week or the 100 day moving average, uh, that's clearly a negative sign for the market. Any attempted bounce that we've seen this week has been met with selling uh, and closing at the lows of the day. Uh, or toward the lows of the day, as you can see all week here. It's just been uh, very clearly uh, the market is distributing stocks. The last two days, I will point out, it's been tech that's been very weak and growth that's been very weak and money has been rotating into value names. Uh, and that is kind of a symbol of money wanting to stay in the market, but not wanting to be in the riskier sectors. And I think you've got a... Uh, you want me to bring up that spider chart uh, now? Oh yeah, yeah. If you can show that sector chart where it's just utility. Yeah. Just so this is this is what we're, yeah, this is what we're looking at this week, and it's very clear uh, that uh, the risky sectors, technology and cyclicals, uh, mostly real estate, also because of rising interest rates. But the this is a performance through uh, this week, and the outperforming sectors are very clearly the defensive ones, utilities. Uh, consumer staples or defensive and financials uh, and energies in there as well. So it's a matter of rotation now. The market seems like it's taken a little bit of a pause at this level uh, with the money not coming out of the market, but going into the defensive sectors. Um, for example, SPYV, the value half of the S&P 500 is up today uh, by, hold on one second, let me bring the chart up. SPYV, which is S&P 500 value, uh, is up 0.7 today, while SPYG, the growth half, 
uh, is down 1.3%. So uh, (laughs) big bifurcation. (laughs) Yeah. Big divergence the last two days, money flowing very clearly out of uh, tech and higher beta. Let's bring up the SPHB, which is the high beta ETF. Uh, That's actually flat today, but SPLV, low volatility, up 0.7. And you can see it's actually been up the last three days uh, as money is flowing into the lower volatility, more defensive type names. Um, we, uh, we, we, I mean, we'll talk about it every night, you know, when, um, between our team, summarizing our team meetings and what goes into the content on the videos and our watch lists, we've got a list. I re- resurrected the 21 over 21, uh, to see what was holding up earlier this week. Half of those have, at least half of them have broken the 21 day moving average. And again, that's more feedback, uh, to the market telling us that the growth type names that we traffic in are not working. Uh, it's been more of a watch list for us than anything else. Our last two holdings are NVIDIA and SMCI, which are being stopped out of today. Um, and that's fine. We'll, um, we'll, we'll keep our beta at that limit of 0.5 where we are. That's kind of the ceiling. Uh, we, have, we may poke our head above it if we get a bounce at a clear, uh, at a clear support level. That looks like it's going to stick. And if some leading stocks start acting better, we're not seeing leading growth stocks act well uh, at all. But we are cognizant of the fact that we undercut and held the 100-day moving average uh, overnight. So for now, that becomes the new line in the sand. If we get down to that level intraday, uh, we'll see what happens there. But for now, we've pulled way back um, and uh, are content to let the market splash around here, rotate and see what sectors are going to lead versus what sectors are going to lag and avoid the laggards, obviously. All right. Let me, let me put my Don Turpiter on for, I mean, I know the stock nerds, um, 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 the the stock nerds understood that quite well, but for the layman that, that kind of watches this podcast and doesn't watch Don's daily market insight videos, which that is really, those are really detailed. It's really good red meat. If you really want to get down to the nuts and bolts, Basically, what he's saying is the market's gotten softer. We got defensive. We've raised 50%. When he says 50% beta, that means we roughly have, not exactly, but roughly 50% cash. So we're we're not fully invested. So if you just got a pie chart for all seasons, asset allocation, and, 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 and a pie chart model, then you're giving up a lot of your gains. And that's really the question. So the S&P was up double digit this year, and now it's, they're probably up less than five, Don. I guess what uh, close, and we're still up high single yeah. digit. Yeah, so we're up yeah. still high because we've pulled things off the table and either aggressively uh, taken profits or 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 cut our our losses on some things. But we raise cash, so our volatility is much lower right now. And if the if the market turns and starts going back up, we'll add some exposure. But if it keeps breaking down, it'll take us completely out if it gets ugly enough. So sometimes these corrections, not all pullbacks turn into correction, but once they do, uh, some of those corrections can really, you know, every once in a while, it'll really start to accelerate and go very quickly and algorithms will kick in and you'll get selling that really happens quickly. People don't realize a bear market can happen in three weeks or less. It can happen fast. It can really go down quickly. So that's why you got to be, you can't overanalyze and overthink it and and th- sometimes when it's time, you've got to make decisions and you've got to be active and do it without hesitation. All right. Said my piece, Don. Go ahead. What do the guys got for us today? Yeah, let's go over to Ted with uh, today, the big Bitcoin celebration day. Uh, <laughs> take it away, Ted. <laughs> yep. So today is the Bitcoin having, and I talked about Bitcoin and some of the miners and various theses in the narrative surrounding Bitcoin last week. And I just wanted to follow up with a quick segment today, looking over Bitcoin's chart itself and the miners and other ways of playing Bitcoin like MSTR and coin. So Don, if you could pull up the Bitcoin chart that I sent you, it was a daily and weekly chart. Last week, I also shared the chart and it was coiling up in a volatility contraction pattern, but we ended up rejecting the 72,000 level and leaked off. Um, today and in the last couple of days, we, we failed, well, we, we had a failed breakdown 
at the 60,000 level and reclaimed it so far. And on the weekly, as you can see, the red line is a 10 week moving average. We also uh, undercut that and reclaimed it. And we actually took a small starter position in Bitcoin um, yesterday. And so for now, it's, it's looking pretty constructive today, especially with the failed below the 60 and reclaim and then a three bar break. And what I mean by three bar break is that uh, the, the present day bar surpasses the highs of the three bars before it. And that's usually a turning point. Uh, three bar breaks, the upside and downside are both valid. So for now, we just want to see how this consolidates. Um, what I want to see is us come up back to the 72,000 level and tighten up and show that supply has stopped coming to market. And from a technical picture, that's all I have about Bitcoin for now. Um, for the listeners who didn't listen to last week's episode, just quickly, the Bitcoin having essentially is the supply issuance of Bitcoin is reduced by 50%. So in this cycle, um, or in the previous cycle, 900 Bitcoin came to market a day or mined. And now after today, it'll go down to 450. So that's that. Don, if you can just pull up iBit, that's the, oh, you do have it up, perfect. That's the, I, that's the proxy that we use to play Bitcoin. It's the most liquid out of all the ETFs. So that is how we're playing that. Um, if you can go to MSTR, the picture is a lot worse um, versus Bitcoin itself. Below the 50 day moving average, multiple closes below now. RS line completely has collapsed. Um, looks like a daily head and shoulders that resolved itself to the downside. So that is not good as well. If you can pull up next Coinbase, the US regulated crypto exchange that actually Dan talked about, and they're the custody um, of most of the ETFs, except the one which Gemini supports. This one is right at the 50 day moving average, struggling a little bit here. The 21 EMA is crossing below as well. Um, this could just be a, the start of base building and in its process of digestion. So not completely, not completely out of the picture. And we just wanna to continue to monitor how this builds its base and as, as Bitcoin progresses. And then quickly we can cover the three, big, the three main Bitcoin miners. Um, they're not looking so healthy either. First one's Mara. Yeah, just complete, just completely collapsed below the two, pretty much closed below the 200 day last few days, reclaiming some of it today, but completely out of the picture for us with, with all those messy moving averages, completely um, misaligned and not in bullish fashion. Next one, Riot. Just even, just even worse than Mara completely under the 200, 21 EMA has crossed below. And if I can see that properly, it had the death cross as well with the 50 day below the 200. And the 200 looks like it's rolling over as well. So definitely a no go zone. Um, RS ratings at 12, RS line has, has been trending downward for, for over like four or five months now. And then the last one, CLSK. much stronger than both Mara and Riot. So if you were to be interested in playing a miner and if Bitcoin obviously has healthy action, CLSK is, is what the market is telling you is the best miner right now, um, actually above all key moving averages. So pretty nice action here um, relative to the other miners. And yeah, so that is what I have about Bitcoin this week. It isn't really important. So historically, Bitcoin makes its biggest move in a cycle after the halving, but we aren't just going to rely on that opinion and historical precedence. We need to wait for the market to, to confirm our thesis before, before uh, taking a bigger position size. Ted, I thought it was kind of interesting that when, you know, when the Middle East first started kind of breaking out and you had gold, you mm -hmm. know, it was a fl flight to quality. You kind of had treasuries and gold kind of pop. And theoretically, yeah. Bitcoin is supposed to be the electronic gold, if you will, because it's mm -hmm. not divisible, whatever. It actually didn't do that. It actually kind of sold off and it 
it struggled kind of like the stocks, like equities. Mm-hmm. It didn't didn't act like, you know, paper gold, if you will. And so that was kind yeah. of I just thought that was interesting. I, I thought it would have been in tandem yeah. with gold. And and adding on to that, what's what's even more interesting now is that equities today have sold off, but gold is trade I mean Bitcoin is trading like gold, silver, copper and commodities. Right. So it, these correlations are just it seems like it's just tank like interchanging frequently these last past or these past couple of months so we'll have to wait and see how it resolves itself and that's that's why you got to pay attention all right ted thanks all right connor's got a uh, data chart of palooza for everybody today starting yes. with sentiment nothing like price to change sentiment right connor <laughs> exactly i love that quote <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, you know, I mentioned breath last week, and I said it was pretty oversold, and you know, uh, it's getting more oversold. So last week, the NAM numbers, and for any listeners that don't know, this is the National Association of Active Investment Managers, and this represents the average exposure to the U.S. equity markets for these people, and this has dropped back down to sixty-two. And that's a pretty uh, steep, steep drop off. And that's pretty evident the market's pulling back. So it makes sense. And in terms of looking at signals for this chart, um, it's kind of a no man's positioning uh, over the hundred area is when, you know, you may want to start getting cautious. And then once positioning is sub 10, that's when, you know, you could be looking for the leaders. So really not telling us a whole lot, but what it is telling is is people have been getting stopped out, um, and that's evident with the market pullback. Um, next one is the investor sentiment survey, and this is compiled of thoughts of the retail investors on, on where they think the market is heading. And I'll just be quick with this one. Um, bullish sentiment is down to 38.3% from, from 43.4% the prior week, so less people are becoming bullish. And then bearer sentiment is up to 34% from 24% from the prior week. So like Don said, nothing like price to chain sentiment. As the market comes down, more people get bearish. Um, And then CNN fear and greed index. This, um, if anyone's interested, I can send you the link to this. This looks at like eight different indicators to develop a reading. And this is in fear already, 34. So people are getting a little fearful. And rightfully so with the war and all that, all the politics and everything going on. And just one month ago, we were in greed. So this is changing. And once this goes into the single digits, into extreme fear, you can maybe start putting your contrarian hat on. Um, I didn't show this last week. The next is percent of stock, S&P 500 stocks above moving averages. So only 9% of S&P 500 stocks are above the 20-day moving average. And when you look at that chart, um, some that's sometimes in the market can see a bounce um, that's getting pretty low. And then the 50-day, only 28% of S&P 500 stocks are above the 50-day. So that, again, is approaching a bounce area. And then long-term, um, above the 200-day moving average, 66% of S&P 500 stocks are above. So that still displays that Despite this correction so far, the market has been trending up and majority of the stocks are still in a long-term uptrend evident by being above the 200-day moving average. Um, And then if we go to the NASDAQ McClellan summation index, like I mentioned last week, this has been going sideways and now it's starting to accelerate to the downside and that has coincided with the market. and when you look at the RSI, the RSI is near around 9, 10 level. And that coincides with like the October low. So breath deterioration um, has been taking place and that's getting, you know, buried in, in pretty, pretty dang oversold territory. And it still is trending below the 10 day moving average, which is a good, which is a good guide. And if you go back, um, most of the best trading for breakouts, for buying strength, this indicator is going to be trending to the upside. So that's just something to remind yourself. 
And then the NASDAQ McClellan oscillator. This is more of a short term momentum breath gauge. And this is um, below the zero line, which is another good um, indicator that I like to use sometimes when this is below the zero line, buying strength, buying breakouts is gonna likely lead to some frustration. And so, um, and so yeah, that's for breath. And to conclude, um, these are all sec secondary indicators. They are very oversold. Um, and you can stack the evidence that these are telling you that the market may want to get a short-term relief bounce. But like Don mentioned earlier, price is always the most important. So that would have to coincide with the S&P bouncing off a of key support, uh, the 100-day moving average, which held today. And those are... Um, and you just stack the ev evidence um, to, to make a thesis and, and decide. And then I just want to conclude with this. Um, staying overbought in a strong uptrend is bullish and staying oversold in a pullback is bearish. So I'll just leave you guys with that um, because just because these are oversold doesn't mean the market's going to bounce. Oh, yeah. So I, I, was a, I was just about to make that point, Connor. I was going to say, you know, oscillating indicators are very, very good when you're kind of in a range-bound market and it's kind of going yeah. back and forth. But when you're in a strong uptrend, it, you can just become more overbought. You, can, you, you, don't get it, you, you don't get a chance to get in. And if it's going down, it can just keep getting oversold. So if you're in a strong uptrend or a strong downtrend, you got to put those oscillators on the shelf for a little while. You got to pause them or, you know, maybe like he said, it's a secondary indicator. Now, if it does start to bounce, if you do start seeing price improving and on good volume, remember, every indicator flows out of price and or volume. Every indicator. So if you can follow the price and volume, you may actually get a little bit earlier indication of what's going to happen and those oscillators may be confirming. Those, those sentiment indicators he's talking about, the market runs up and everybody gets FOMO and everybody wants in. So usually near market tops is when everybody's super bullish. And then after the market starts tanking, everybody gets more and more scared. And then it as it's going down, and so it's bottoming, people are the most pessimistic. Think it's going to continue to go down. They're going to extrapolate. So actually, we use sentiment indicators as a contra indicator. We're not usually paying attention to try to to actually show the market trend, we're looking for a contra indicator for a reversal. Don, is there anything else you want to add for this week coming into next week? Yeah, yeah. I want to combine the chart uh, of the S and P 500 with this NASI McClellan sum in, uh, summation index that uh, Connor uh, presented in one of his charts. I want to focus on last fall when we had this three waves down correction in the S&P 500. And I put on uh, the stochastic up here. The stochastic looks back and it compares what price is currently doing to what it did in the prior 14 uh, bars. So you see it drop here from overbought down to oversold. And during each of these attempted rallies, the two attempted rallies during the three waves down, we came off of oversold and rallied up near overbought but never quite quite got above overbought if you compare the same time frame here to clones that lags a little bit but sometimes that's a good thing that it lags you can see the three waves down on here but note on the index the rsi never came off of overbought so combining the chart with the s p 500 where it showed yes we're in an attempted rally this summation index never indicated that it was healthy enough to come out of oversold. And these are the types of things that we analyze on a daily basis in here to give us clues to the underlying strength of the market. Uh, and I thought that was a good example of uh, two different indicators uh, that uh, and how they behave in different periods of time while the market's doing certain behaviors. And so you're looking for confirmation as well. Confirmation, yeah. Or... Uh, maybe not the all clear which is uh right. coming from this uh nazi it's not so good stuff there so connor pause it. right yeah. yeah yeah you're right or we wouldn't get as heavy back in as we would you know we we go a lot by moving averages and there's never a way to know for sure once you get back above if you're going to stay back above in this case there were two failed rally attempts 
But then the third uh, rally attempt that we saw back at the beginning of November went on a 20% run. So you never know for sure. Uh, you look for the confirmation. You keep your stops in place. If it if it works, you ride the wave. If it doesn't, uh, you jump off the, the surfboard as the wave uh, fails. So uh, it's just a matter of having your rules, time-tested rules, and adhering to them. Hey, folks, listen. Uh, um, this is why it's so important to pay attention in, to the markets. And we have already done this. We've already pulled lots of cash on the sidelines over the past week, week and a half. You can go watch Don's videos to see what we've we've done. We don't we archive. We don't take anything down. You can go back and see what we were saying during COVID, in February, March of 2020. You can look at see what we were saying about anything. Here's the deal. Right now, the market is weak. Is it going to hold here? It may. It may not. Right now, we're still technically in an uptrend. But if the market continues to falter and go down further, that could change. We're at very key levels right here. We're, this is important that we need to hold these levels. Otherwise, Katie barred the door. But again, I ask you, have you made any adjustments to your portfolio? Or have you simply given back most of the gains this year? The NASDAQ's given up not all of its gains, but almost all of them. I think smalls are negative now or flat. And the S&P is still up, what, four, four and a half, Don, something like that year to date? Yeah, four and a half. It was up 10, now it's up four and a half. Yeah, up, so it's given back quite a bit. Uh, we were up about 12, 13. We're still up at eight, eight and a half, whatever, nine. So we're a little bit high, but we're taking it off. And now we are much less volatile. So if the market goes down, we're actually in very, very good shape. And if it starts to go back up, we can start getting back in and looking for the strongest positions. The old, you know, you're only one trade away or two trades away from getting back in. So people always ask me, well, if I sell out, how do I know how to get back in? One word answer, rules. You need rules for your money. Don't listen to Wall Street. Don't listen to the brokerage firms. They think it's their money, not your money. And they tell you, you just have to have an asset allocation pie chart for all seasons. Think about that. For all seasons. That's like saying I can wear a parka snow skiing or at the beach, or I can wear a bikini at the beach or snow skiing. And Don, I look good in a bikini. I just I'm sure you do, especially I, when you're skiing, Dan. I was about to say, I just won't wear one skiing. <laughs> That'd be kind of tough. Anyway, folks, listen. If you lie, it's a little tongue in cheek, but things are a little dicey right now. So now is really the time to pay attention and have some rules in your portfolio. If you need some help, just reach out to us. You can just go to revereasset.com. Up in the right hand corner, there's a subscribe button, and you can get Don's daily market insight videos. Every night the market is open. He does a short 10, 15 minute video on the short term, mid term, and long term strength of the market. And actually, what we're doing in our portfolios. We're the most transparent advisor in the country that I'm aware of. And then next to that, there's a contact us button. You can just put your, you can, it comes right to me. And you can just send me an email directly if you want, dan at revereasset.com. You can also email don at revereasset.com, ted at revereasset.com, or connor at revereasset.com. If you have any portfolio questions, you want something talked about on this podcast, or you're simply, or you're simply wanting to, um, 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 you're simply wanting uh, to have a complimentary portfolio review or want a stock to talk about. You can also call us old school at 855 Real Wealth. We'll talk to you next week on your money. Because it's not how much you made in the markets, it's how much of that you can keep. <laughs>